Okay, we uh, welcome to the fourth session of uh, the parables. We have one more to go, but it will not be next week. Next week, I won't be here. We're going to be going up north for the week. But the following week thereafter, um, we'll conclude with our fifth session. And you, uh, you remember the schedule that we had. Maybe you have a copy of that schedule. In any case, um, that fifth session will deal with the parable of the laborers and their wages. Uh, so we'll study that and teach that parable um, the last for the last time. Now, tonight we have no TV, no overheads or anything like that. I'm going to ask you to do your writing, fill in the boxes as we go column by column by column. And uh, you notice that there are six uh, rows of boxes, and each row corresponds to the question above, the six questions that we are learning to ask with respect to uh, the parables. Question one, about literary context. Two, about Old Testament background. Three, what are the scenes of the parable? And four, what is its surprise or surprises? Five, what does it reveal about the gospel? Tell us about God or Jesus. And six, how does its teaching relate to you in your life? The parables we've chosen for tonight all come from Matthew 13. And um, Matthew 13, the first one, uh, we, you know, I put the title there that is probably in your Bibles too, mustard seed, leaven, and the net. But I want to remind you again that the titles of the parables are editorial decisions and that the parables themselves uh, say much more than what the noun suggests. So, for example, if I were to retitle that first one, I would retitle it the parable of the buried mustard seed, and in that word buried lies the secret, I hope, to, uh, to uh, open up to you tonight about that parable. And with the leaven, I would, uh, we're going to read that in a moment, but I would retitle it the parable of the hidden leaven, and you'll see why when we read that. And uh, with the net, it would be the parable of the submerged, the submerged, the underwater net that catches the fish, and we'll see why when we read that parable. Okay, so that's the first introductory comment about what's going on tonight. The second introductory comment is a comment about the kingdom of God. Now, last week, uh, I think we identified three possible uh, reference, E-N-T-S, things the kingdom refers to. The first referent is in the heart of the, of the believer, that the kingdom of God is the personal rule of Jesus over our hearts. Now, this is important because you, sad to say, there are folks who miss this component, this referent, this reality, and they go to the other two. And the other two are the church, the church as the outpost of the kingdom, where God's rule, Jesus' rule, is um, evident in the world through the means of grace, through the preaching of the gospel, the administration of baptism, and the administration of the Lord's Supper. We call those ordinances. <coughs> now, that's the second referent, the church. The third referent is the world itself. God's kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, is as wide it's as large, as comprehensive as life in the world, in society, societal relationships. So we can talk about the authority of God's rule in the field of education. We can talk about the authority of God's rule in the field of, of politics or economics or any other societal sphere. I think you have to keep those three related but distinct but you have to keep them also in that order, in that priority. And uh, let me explain using, uh, if I can, there we go, find, there's a, a, a catechism that you may have heard of called the Heidelberg Catechism. And the Heidelberg Catechism 
gives an explanation, as many catechisms in the Reformation time did, gives an explanation of the Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, all these reformers believed, coming out of the Catholic tradition, that believers in the church, particularly children, need to be taught these three minimal, basic, foundational um, areas of Christian doctrine and life. Remember I said Christian doctrine and life, and life. These things are not simply for the head, these are for the heart. The Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, you know that creed. The Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. The Heidelberg Catechism is one of the most beloved catechisms because it's very personal, it's very intimate, and it asks this question about the Lord's Prayer. You might not, <clears throat> you might not ever have heard this. What is the second petition of the Lord's Prayer? If I were to ask you, what's the address of the Lord's Prayer? It's our Father. Isn't it interesting that Jesus did not teach us to pray, my Father. He taught us to pray, our Father, because we belong to the church. We belong to a group. Here's the second petition, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. What do you mean by that, asks the catechism. Thy kingdom come, that is, so govern us by your word and spirit that we may submit ourselves unto you more and more. Preserve and increase your church. Ah, notice. What's the first one? Rule more and more in us that we may submit more and more to you. Second one, preserve and increase your church. Third, destroy the works of the devil, every power that exalts itself against you and all wicked devices formed against your holy word until the full coming of your kingdom in which you will be all in all. You, that's what you mean when you say thy kingdom come. First rule me, then preserve and increase your church and then let your rule extend in the whole world. Now. That's important to understand when we come to these parables tonight in Matthew 13. Look with me at Matthew 13, 31 and 32. Let me read these verses, uh, 31 and 32. He, that is Jesus, put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, okay, here we go. So the object of comparison, the kingdom of heaven. The comparison is this entire parable. It's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, as a story goes, that's not very impressive. I mean, we don't have people except the sower of the seed. We don't have much movement in the parable like a, like a story or a narrative. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. The son leaves, the son wastes his father's money, the son comes back. There's a whole narrative. Or the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's a, there's a man who is beset by robbers and another Samaritan, co or the Samaritan comes and takes care of him and so on. There's a, there's a, a narrative, a plot, characters. Here in this parable, all we have really is a seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed. So you're saying to yourself, boy, what do I get out of this? Well, remember, remember the story of the fish, the student and the fish. I gave that to you, I think I passed that out to you last week, that sheet with the story of the student who looked and looked and studied and studied and drew and, and analyze that fish almost until he was blind. That's what we got to do with the Bible. Study, 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 read, think, 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 and try to meditate. So what about this seed? Tonight we're talking about the process of the kingdom. You see the title of tonight's lesson? The process of the kingdom, the kingdom's progress. What does it do in the world? What does it do? 
Well, if we look at the parable here, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field, smallest of all seeds. Now, please understand, the Bible is not a botanical textbook. I'm not suggesting the Bible made a mistake here, or Jesus did, but, but the emphasis here is on how the, the, the mustard seed is a very small, exceedingly small seed. There are seeds, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are seeds that are smaller than mustard seeds. So when it says here, the smallest of all seeds, it was reflecting perhaps what, what could be seen with the naked eye in that day and age, what people assumed about seeds, etc. But I would, I would rather see that word smallest, which is, by the way, in English, if you like a grammar lesson here, that's a superlative. And superlatives as, as adjectives can be smallest, very small, exceedingly small. And that's what I would like to use tonight, exceedingly small. But what happened? Go ahead. Sorry, I was just saying also, wasn't that a reference to the seeds that were among the kosher law as well, right? Yes. So that, you know, what, okay, what are you saying? That it was not allowed or it was, it was. among the ones that were allowed to the Israelites. Yes, yes. As you know, as you know, of course, the Israelites were not allowed to eat just anything. Later tonight, we're going to have a parable of the fish, fishes. And a net is going to catch all kinds. Well, Israel was not allowed to eat all kinds or any kind of fish, um, particularly those fish that kind of groveled on the bottom of the, of the sea, they were not allowed to eat. But mustard seed would be a permissible, a permissible seed, right? Okay, now, if I were to tell you, as you look at this parable, stare at, stare at that seed, watch that seed. What happens to that seed, that's where the juice of the parable is. That's where the meat of the parable is. It's a grain of seed that a man took and sowed in his field. Now, let me ask you the question. Um, how do far, what do farmers do with regard to seed? We've had a parable of the sower already, remember that? And I tried to illustrate it by saying that he has a, uh, probably a basket on his hip and he takes that seed and he broadcasts it, you know, and it lands on top of the soil, birds come and get it. Remember that parable? Okay, but this parable says that the kingdom of heaven is like a seed small seed that a man sowed. Now, the literary context in box one, I would simply say the literary context of this parable in box one on the left-hand column is that Jesus is giving us, he's teaching us about the mystery of the kingdom. And it's been going on in all of chapter 13, all of chapter 13. Okay, now we need to look at some Old Testament background and I have some passages for you to write down and look up with me, if you will. In the second box, box two, what are some Old Testament passages? Ezekiel, Ezekiel 17, verse 23. Ezekiel 17, verse 23. Now you remember Ezekiel's in the Old Testament. You've got Isaiah. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a long book, 17, verse 23. All right. We have in 1723, let's go back, let's go back to 22 so we can get its, its context. Ezekiel 17, 22, thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. Here comes 23. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar and under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches 
birds of every sort will nest. Now I understand this is not a mustard seed. This is a cedar tree, okay? But the idea that I want you to get is that this notion of a big plant that would be large enough to hold birds, cover birds, house birds, nest birds, that is an Old Testament image. It's an Old Testament image or metaphor. And in this particular passage, it's referring to Israel. Israel is going to be this cedar, new young twig. Think of Israel coming back after the exile. Pastor Josh is preaching on Ezra, and we're seeing that the people that came back and settled in, in Jerusalem were a very scraggly bunch, kind of weak, nothing prestigious about them. They had no accomplishments to brag about, kind of a scraggly bunch. That's what this picture is about. The Lord is going to take a tender shoot, a small, young, tender shoot. He's going to plant it. It's going to become big. Cedar trees were world famous in Lebanon and in the area around uh, Israel. Very, very famous because they were huge, strong, mighty trees. So that's kind of the picture that we have from the parable. Now, I want you to turn to Daniel. A couple, the next book in the Bible is Daniel. After Ezekiel comes Daniel. Four, Daniel four, verse 12. Okay, and here again, let's, uh, let's read verse nine. Go back to verse nine. O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree. Okay, here we go again. A tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Here comes 12. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. So you have the metaphor, an image here of a plant, it's called a tree, a huge one, and its branches now are, are multiple, many, and it gives, it gives uh, room for or it gives roosting and shade for the birds of the heavens who lived in its branches. Again, this, this was a vision. Nebuchadnezzar had a vision, and he had a vision given him by God of what was going to happen, what was really going to happen to Israel. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon, and that kingdom was going to go down, but Israel's kingdom was going to go up. All right? Now, with that image from the Old Testament in your mind, let's go back to the parable. Let's go back to the parable and ask some questions. <clears throat> Remember, we have a mustard seed. 1331. The man took one little seed and he sowed it. Now, I'm going to give you a little hint here. There's the surprise in the parable. He sowed it. He buried it. He buried it in the ground. All right. Now think of when Jesus is teaching this. He's teaching this to his disciples and to, well, to the crowds, remember, to the crowds. He's explaining it to his disciples at a time when Israel was nothing, nothing. Who occupied the land of Israel? Tell me. Who was the boss in this day? The Romans. The Romans called the shots. They were the ones who set the laws, made the rules, who appointed or deposed, who put in office and took out of office. Israel was a nothing at this time. And remember the Old Testament prophecies, God is going to make Israel great. And if you're a Jew now, if you're an Israelite, a God-believing, Bible-reading, Bible-believing Jew, you're going to ask yourself the question, where, when, 
When is this going to happen? And Jesus is revealing here a secret of the mystery of the kingdom. It's going to happen when a little seed, very little seed, is buried and what happens? It grows. Now, let me ask you this question. I'm not going to answer it. I'm not going to tease. Here's the question. Do you know anything in the Gospels that was buried and came out and grew, 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 grew? Jesus. Jesus. Now, you, yeah, there's, that's, there's the Sunday school answer, right? Yeah, Jesus, Jesus. But that's not the wrong, that's the dead right answer. Because I want to, I want to remind you that in the New Testament, how can I say this? How can I say this? The kingdom of God is equivalent to Jesus. If you're looking for the kingdom, look at Jesus. If you want to see what the kingdom is like, what justice and mercy and order and, and so on, what the, what the kingdom is like, look at Jesus. Because what you see in Jesus is what you're going to see in the kingdom. That's not a surprise, is it? The kingdom reflects its king. And if Jesus is the king, the kingdom is going to reflect Jesus. Now, here's the mystery. For this kingdom and king to grow and to become anything in the world, it's got to be buried. It's got to be buried. And Jesus here is talking about the kingdom, him, being sown in the soil, buried underground in order to, in order to grow into a leafy, huge tree. Now, you say, where do I get this from? Turn with me. You have your Bible open to Matthew 13. Go back once more. Go back once more to Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Verse 9, and you see maybe that heading in your Bible helps you to see that that passage is about healing a man with a withered hand. You remember that story? It's synagogue. It's Sabbath. And there's a healing going to take place. And it, Jesus heals this man and he gets the leaders so fiery angry. They are so angry with him. Look at uh, verse 13. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man stretched it out. It was restored healthy like the other. Here's the key verse. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. You read a verse like that and you, you know, maybe you stifle a yawn. Hey, this verse is very important in the Bible, in the Gospels, because it tells us what's going on around Jesus. When Jesus walks down the street, maybe, maybe you've seen, I don't know, pictures of this, of the Gospels. And you see Jesus with his disciples and it looks like they're going on a picnic. That's not what life was like for Jesus. When Jesus is traveling with his disciples in the, in the Gospels, he is, he is in, the, in, the, in the context of hostility. These people are against him. These, these leaders of the Jews are looking to destroy him. And it's in that context that he says to his disciples, if you want to see the kingdom, watch me and watch what happens to me. You can almost hear him or see him pointing to those leaders in the outskirts of the crowd. They're going to get me. They're going to come and get me and they're going to put me in the ground. They're going to put me in the ground like a little exceedingly small mustard seed. And I'm going to grow. I'm going to rise from the ground and I'm going to grow. And the birds, the birds are going to nest in the branches that I figuratively, figuratively, that I become. Does that make sense? Do you understand? You understand? Now let's talk about what that, what that means for us. Look at, uh, look at number five. Box number five. I gave you there a scripture passage because I want you to think about what this reveals to us further about God. I gave you there a passage, 1 Corinthians 1. You see that in the box? 1 Corinthians 1, 
verses 26 to 31. Verses 26, 1 Corinthians 1. Okay? I'll read it for us. And think about mustard seed now. Think about little becoming big. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Think of the early church. How poor they were. How simple they were. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Now you get, now you get the, 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 the good and great things, wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So as it is written, let, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Folks, this is what grace is about. God takes what is weak, low, of no account, no, no accomplishments, no ribbons, no trophies. He takes them and he puts into them his wisdom, his righteousness, his holiness, his power, and his goodness. Okay, now, now I'm going to ask you to interact with me. If that's what, because now we're going to go to box six. Box six. If that's what the kingdom is like, insignificant, seed, buried, rises, rises to power. Okay, if that's what the kingdom is like, because that's what Jesus is like, what does that mean for us? When we look at how God's kingdom works in the world, where can we expect that kingdom to operate, to move, to gain adherence? Where can we expect that according to what we've been looking at? Anybody? Say what? The poor, the weak. The weak. Just think about that a minute. You're right. We can expect the kingdom of God to find, not by nature, but by grace, by grace, find a home, oftentimes, oftentimes, among the poor and the weak. He takes what is nothing, so to speak, and he resurrects that or he redeems and recreates that nothing into something big so that God's kingdom out of that little, exceedingly small nothing becomes something large, huge in the world. I want you to think about this a minute. Has it ever stopped you in your thinking to ponder why Poor people are more receptive to the gospel than rich people. Why is that? Why do you think? Talk to me about that. Why would... Say again? Yes. Poor people sense a need, don't they? They're looking for something more. They're looking often by nature, but please understand... I, I did not say, and I would not say, that God loves the poor more than he loves the rich. I would not say that. I'm just talking about how the gospel operates. And the gospel operates very effectively often among people who sense a need. People who, who don't think that they have a lot to offer. Whereas the rich, the rich tend to be self-sufficient, self-satisfied, uh, they can do it on their own. They don't need God. That's why Jesus said in another place, it's very hard. Notice he didn't say impossible. He said it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And why is that? Well, because rich people tend to think they don't have any needs. They don't have any needs. Now, let me ask you this question. What we just talked about 
they're, they're poor and weak. They have a sense of need. What does that mean for our mission activity as a congregation? Any idea, any implications? Any suggestions? Say again. Ministry to children. Ministry to children. Take, for example, how children, by definition, children are vulnerable. Children are weak. Children are dependent. Huh? Oftentimes, uh, children cling to their parents and they don't venture out on their own. They haven't learned those habits yet. So children's ministry, excuse me, is the kind of ministry that fits fits with the nature of the kingdom. What other kinds of ministries, missions, fits? Widows. Say? Widows. 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 In the Bible, of course, widows were a special class because they were not protected. They were often um, taken advantage of and uh, defenseless. And that's why in James, he says, this is true and undefiled religion to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Nowadays, widows are not quite in the same category. They have their weekly bowling outings and their weekly lunches, and you know, I'm teasing a little bit, but, but uh, nonetheless, they are, as a class, they tend to be more exposed, vulnerable, and so on. Very good. Can you think of any other kinds of classes like that? Children, widows. People that are in need. Okay. People who have, you know, <clears throat> this is something that I have to admit that I need to think more about in a, in a biblical way, that people who are in need the basic needs of food, shelter, clothing, etc. It seems to me that as a church, it's not ours always to ask for how come? How come they're poor? Why don't they have food? Sometimes it is because, because in the church, as opposed to the state, I want you to see this, the church, as opposed to the state, is interested in helping people out of their need. Think resurrection, okay? Think resurrection, recreate, out of their need to flourishing. Now, how do you do that? Well, initially, you got to put food in their stomachs. Initially, you got to give them a place to live. Initially. But then as we go on, we teach, we disciple responsibility, we disciple Stewardship, we disciple all these virtues that self-control, patience, we, these virtues that belong to kingdom living. Huh? The state can't do that. You realize that, don't you? Yeah, but in a sense, we've allowed the state to fill the role that the church is supposed to have. Okay, that's a very the church has stepped back unless the state do it. That's a very good point. He said the, the church has stepped back and let the state do it so that by default, we might say, by default, the state has taken over what really belonged and belongs to the church. Huh? But you know, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. But now look at what happened. Look around you. And I'm not making any kind of nasty political point here because I think the political point covers all political parties, and that is this, the temptation by the state to use the poor to gain more power. You see the difference? The reason the church attends to the poor is to restore flourishing in the image of God. The reason most often the state, the government attends to the poor is to enhance their power whether it is by loyalty, whether it is by voting, whether it is by whatever. The state, look, the state's interest is power, always, always has been. That's not a criticism, by the way. If you read the Bible, the beauty of the Bible is that 
it limits the state's power. It doesn't withhold the state's power, it limits it. Unfortunately, if you walk away from the Bible, you've walked away from the limits on power that God establishes. So I think we have to be very careful that we don't become cynical about the poor because of the way the state treats the poor. Do I like it when people who don't work get thousands of dollars in relief? No, I don't like that. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's good either, by the way. I think it's extremely destructive. And we're going to see within our lifetimes, as a result of the last three years of government policy, we're going to see the destructiveness of that kind of policy. Just giving people without their effort, sometimes without their even asking for it, giving them money. Let's see what that does for the economy. Let's see what that does for the workforce, the labor force. Anyway, I'm not, I'm, I want to get back to the kingdom. The kingdom of God says these people need help. They don't need to be used. They need help in order to be, I, I, I use this word on purpose, to be resurrected, to be brought to life in Christ, in Christ. Let's not forget forgiveness of sins, grace, eternal life. Let's not minister only to the body and forget about the soul, please. But you see, that kind of kingdom work aims at their flourishing, as I, as I described it, okay? Now, let's go on to the next, par the next parable. Keep your Bible open at Matthew 13. Matthew 13. See, these parables are not that long, but I think they are profound. They are profound. Let me read... Matthew 13, 33. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven. Oh, we got the same subject again. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Give me a synonym for leaven. Yeast. Okay. We'll clear that up in a minute. That a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Now that, that's all there is to this parable. Not a lot of characters, not a lot of big plot, not a lot of development in the story. We have leaven, but now we've got to do a little study about this leaven. You ladies who go to the store to buy yeast, you come home with little packets, don't you? Doesn't yeast come in in packets and when you're ready you tear open the packet and you sprinkle that yeast. That's not that's not what it was like in the ancient world. Um, I think this is true. I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in yogurt. But do not people save and cultivate yogurt specimens so that they can culture? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, okay. it's starters, yeah, yeah. How does that work? Does that with yogurt or with? Uh, yogurt's they all more have of a bacteria. Say again? Yogurt's more of a bacteria. A starter for your like bread will be more of a yeast. Oh. Um, so it's different stuff and then it, it has like different properties. Yep. Like Okay, but that starter, you, you store in something? Yeah, you keep it by itself. Yeah. You keep it, uh-huh. Every so often, like, they'll add more flour to it because, like, consumes, like, okay. Because it's not allowed to grow. Okay. It's a process. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chemical something that happens, huh? A chemical fermentation? Not chemical, biological. Biological. Okay. Sorry. I told you, I'm not an expert. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Well, that's kind of like that's kind of like what this was in the old world and the ancient world. You know, the, uh, the neighbor lady would give her neighbor lady something with which I guess a culture, a starter to make bread. And, you know, they'd keep it alive and they'd keep it going. That's what it was like. OK, but now notice. He says, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Think starter yeast that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour. Now, I may have said you this, told you this earlier, but the mystery, in my opinion, in the parable is the verb. 
hid. I've never met yet um, a lady making bread who hides yeast in the dough. Sprinkle it, maybe. Mix it, you know. But to hide, look, three measures of flour is a lot. That's a lot of, a lot of grain, a lot of flour. But she takes it and she hides. She hides it as in conceals it, bury. Ooh, there we've got that verb again. Buries, buries the leaven in the dough or the flour. Now let's talk about the leaven. Go back in the Old Testament with me. Go back in the Old Testament with me to Leviticus 7. Leviticus 7. Now, while you're turning there, Leviticus 7, 13. While you're turning there, tell me, do you know any Jewish practices? Do you have any Jewish friends who, who talk about the feast of unleavened bread or before Passover comes, they have to get rid of all the... How, how does that go? They have to clean the whole house. It's like sprinkling. Yeah. They yeah. clean it all out because they have to get rid of every speck of leaven which represents sin. Okay, that's where I wanted to go with this. I wanted to go right where you ended up here. In the Bible, oftentimes, not always, not, we're, we're going to see that, oftentimes leaven is a metaphor for sin. And, and leaven, the Apostle Paul talks about in Corinthians, that leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, a little bit of sin permeates the whole business and makes the whole business nasty. That's the negative view. And I want you to understand that is a Bible view, but that's not the Bible view here in this parable. In this parable, leaven here is a good thing. It's a positive thing. And I want to bring you to some verses that talk about that. Leviticus 17, verses 13 and 14. Uh, let me read. This is about the peace offering that one offers to the Lord. If he offers it, I'm reading in 12. If he offers it for thanksgiving, he shall offer with a thanksgiving sacrifice unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. Now here we come in 13. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall bring his offering with loaves of leavened bread. So you see, leaven was not always a negative metaphor or image. You come to the Lord with loaves of leavened bread, and from it he shall offer one loaf from each offering as a gift to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who throws the blood, who throws or casts the blood of the peace offerings. <coughs> By the way, when you think of a process, what's the difference between the grain and the loaf of bread. What has happened? That's exactly right. I know it looks obvious, doesn't it? It sounds simple. A lot of work. You know what we call that work? Culture. We call that work culture. When you plant a seed in the ground and then you weed it and it grows, that's called agriculture. Huh? You grow a plant. Arboriculture, a tree, arboriculture. The process between raw material and finished product is called culture. I want you to see in the Old Testament offering, God received from the hands of his people their products of culture. Now you think about that in terms of your work, your life's work. What products of culture have you been busy with in terms of... Well, we don't live in an agricultural economy. We live in an industrial economy. Or now it's an information economy. So some people make cars. Some people make houses. Some people make, they give advice for a living and they make people uh, wealthy, let's say. I don't know. But whatever your culture is, it is worth sacrificing part of it to God. 
That's what this peace offering symbolized. That was a little side note. That one's free, okay? Now, turn with me to 23, Leviticus 23, verse 17. Leviticus 23, verse 17. Now, I know we're in the Old Testament, and you're saying to yourself, Old Testament, Leviticus, Shmanliticus, what do I want out of that? Look at 23, 17. You shall come back in 15. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Don't worry about the counting. I'll take care of that. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. If you're an Israelite, those two words mean a lot. With leaven. Because so much of life is getting rid of the leaven. Sweep the house. You got it done? Do it again. The kitchen, countertop, the floor, cupboards. Get rid of the leaven. I mean, leaven was a pain in the neck. But here comes the Lord and he says, no, I want you to come with leaven. He wants us to come here, the Israelites. He wanted them to come with their loaves baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. First fruits as you know from the Bible, means first of what's yet to come. The first fruit was always the, the first cutting, the first animal, the first whatever, as a promise that the rest is also going to be dedicated to the Lord. So, all right, all that's background here to leaven. Now we go back to the parable. The parable in a, 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 Matthew. 13. It's only one verse, folks. And yet, Matthew 13, 33, let me say it one more time. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. I'm asking the question tonight, how does the kingdom work? Come. It grows. Very good. It grows. There's a, a swelling, growing process that occurs. That dough, that ye, uh, sorry, that flour is permeated with the leaven and it grows. What does it say in the text? It says, hid in three measures until it was all leavened. Now, I'm going to tweak what you said a moment ago. You said it grows. And it does. I don't disagree with you. But what does the parable say? What does the parable say? It says she hid it in three measures until what? Until it was all leavened. So I don't deny, I don't disagree with you, it grows. But the point of the parable is it permeates. It permeates. It saturates. It penetrates. Now let's pause a minute here. Remember, I keep telling you the parables are about Jesus. The kingdom is about Jesus. And when we look at this leaven, Jesus, it's coming because the crowds are conspiring already. The leaders are conspiring to destroy him. He's going to be, somebody's going to take him and stuff him. I don't mean any disrespect stuff him in the ground for three days. And what's going to happen? He's going to arise Easter. And between Easter and today, what has happened? That leaven, that yeast, has permeated, permeated the world. Permeated the world. You know how much it has permeated the world? I'll tell you how much. It has permeated so much that when you go down the street and you talk to people and you say something like, the day of reckoning is coming. They know what you're talking about. Why? 
because that's part of our vocabulary, our Christian vocabulary. If you read, you can hear it on the news, you can hear it on TV, despite what they say, they betray the, the influence of Christian culture, the influence of Christian culture in language, in, in metaphor, and so on, okay? I, I'm, I'm coming up dry right now. Can you, think of, can you think of how people use language and metaphor without even knowing its Christian origin? You know what I'm talking about? Can you give me an example better than what I've given you of how, apocalypse. say what? Okay, yeah, if somebody on the news talks about this hurricane coming and it's apocalyptic, and this is going to be apocalyptic, where'd that word come from? Whew. That word came from the book of Revelation, which in Greek is apocalypse. That word in our vocabulary is tied to the Bible, okay? And there's so many, there's so many, say what? Church. church, yeah. Yeah. And if you say, you know, I, <clears throat> I have a naughty little, I have a naughty little joke that I play with people when I'm, I'm sitting down and they want to sit next to me and they say, is this seat saved? I said, I don't know if it went up yet to the altar. <laughs> the point being, and you've seen the signs too, huh? On the billboard, Jesus saved, so should you. <laughs> That's, of course, uh, a, a play on words, equivocation on the word saves. Jesus saves, so should you. But you can't get away from the influence, the permeation, the penetration. Now, what does this have to do with our lives? Think about this. <clears throat> I mean, Pastor Josh is preaching about this all the time, isn't he? Can you keep, have you tried baking bread and confining the yeast or the leaven to one part of the dough? No can do. Not unless you put it in a different bowl. You cut it up and put it in a different bowl. You're going to have to separate it, right? What part of your life can you keep the gospel out of? I can't think of any part of my life that I cannot find the relevance of the gospel or the kingdom or Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't know that Jesus has much to do with, you fill in the blank. I don't think Jesus has much to do with education. Oh, you don't? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. You know, the Bible says in, in one of the Psalms, in your light, we see light. You want your children to be educated in light, in truth, in wisdom? Where's that light come from? It doesn't come from the ground. It, it comes from above. In your light, we see light. Again, fill in the blank. I, I don't see the relevance of Jesus or the Bible or the gospel or the kingdom of God to to my business life. Hmm. Do you have any employees? Do you care about them? Do you care for them? Are you an employee? Do you care about your boss? Which is different than asking, do you care about the success of the company? Do you care about the boss means, do you care about him or her as a person? Huh? I don't know that the gospel has anything to do with my, with my business. Well, tell me, what, how does your business impact the environment? You say, oh, you're one of them. <laughs> one of them tree huggers? No, I don't think so. For me, simply to ask the question is not to make me a tree hugger. How does your, how does your business affect the environment? I, I have a friend who, who used to be in the business of Dry cleaning, he used to own a dry cleaning business. I don't know how much you know about dry cleaning, but do you know that they use a lot of chemicals? A lot, a lot of chemicals. So the question becomes, where are them, their chemicals gonna go? Where are they gonna end up? In the city sewer. Uh-uh, uh-uh. 
That's not where they go. So what we have today, and I know some of us don't like many of them, we have inspectors. <laughs> inspectors who come to our businesses and they look things over and they see if the plumbing is all right and the electrical is all right and, and all of that. I think that's a result of the Christian gospel, friends. You might say, boy, that's a, that's a reach. I don't think it is at all. Because those kinds of inspections involve safety. They involve stewardship. They really do involve the environment, protecting the environment. And I think all those questions belong to the set of questions the kingdom of God is interested in. Remember that parable of the mustard seed and the tree with the birds? Do you know, how many birds do you think are going to be saved? You say, well, I didn't know birds are going to be saved. Well, do you think in the new heavens and the new earth there will be any birds? Well, if I read the Bible correctly, I think what we're going to see in the new heavens and the new earth is a creation purged of sin, purged of suffering, purged of pain and evil. Well, I think that might include dogs and cats and birds. I think. Now, please understand, that's kind of a going out on a limb here, a speculation. I don't know if your fluffy dies, whether you ought to have a funeral or any of that stuff. But, you know, sometimes with kids, we have to handle these things very, very carefully, don't we? But I don't know what it's going to be like, but I do know that God promises a new heavens and a new earth. And the only earth that I know of Sadly, is this one broken by sin, but I can, from the Bible, get a picture of an earth that is healed, you know, that is healed. It's not going to need any more sun because the light is going to come from Jesus Christ. I don't know how all that's going to happen, but I do know that <clears throat> uh, salvation has implications for creation. So you ask me, leaven, permeation, how far does it permeate? Can you see the stars? That's how far it permeates and beyond. See? Okay, that's, <clears throat> that's the parable of the leaven. All right, now we have a little bit of time yet for the parable of the net or the underwater submerged net. Now we're looking at Matthew 13, 47. Matthew 13, 47. We're near the end of Jesus' day of parable teaching, and he's got one more parable here. <clears throat> this is his last one on this day. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Now, there's the first scene, all right? We're going to pause there a minute, because what comes next is there's going to be a sorting and a so on and so on. But let's talk about this net. I gave you... Tonight, I give you a little bit of Greek lesson in box number four. For those of you who know Greek, you have the Greek alphabet there. But amph amphiblestron is the first one. Amphiblestron. Dictuon is the second one. That's the second kind of net. And the third is sagene. Sagene. You see those three words? Now, I want you to know that in the New Testament, each of those words is used and each points to a different kind of net. That's why I put them there. Because <clears throat> if you go to Matthew 4, just let your finger walk back to Matthew 4, verse 18. Matthew 4, verse 18. Jesus is calling the disciples. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Now, this net, they're probably in a boat, they could be by shore, but the two of them are throwing a net out, and the net probably has weights on each corner, and those weights sink, or maybe they, they have a rope, they, ha they hung onto the rope, of that far corner so that they can pull that net back and around and whatever gets caught in that net, can you visualize it with me? You get the picture? They're pulling that net back and whatever gets caught in that net is their catch. And they get a few fish and they throw it out again. It's very hard work, 
very hard work, okay? That's one kind of net. So that, that word amphiblestron, that really means to throw around, to cast around. All right? The dictuon net, that's in Matthew 4.20. Jesus is not done calling his disciples in Matthew 4.20. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers in the boat, excuse me, with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And these are the dictuon nets. Little different, little different operation. But I want you to see that in this parable, Matthew 13, 47, we have a sagene. Matthew 13, 47. But here's the interesting thing. This is the only time in the Bible that this word is used, this Greek word, sagene, because it's a special kind of net. Notice Jesus' parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea that gathered fish of every kind. Now, it was probably thrown from a boat and they, again, had a technique whereby they were able to pull that net in together and it gathered the fish, it gathered fish of every kind. And now notice what happens. When it was full, the net is full, they drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Now, what if you know the Bible, what would constitute a bad fish? Unclean. Think of the food laws, clean, unclean. Today, the Jews like to speak about kosher or unkosher, but they had fish that were like that too. Again, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I do know that fish that were scavenger fish were not clean. They were unclean fish. Just like um, Israel was not allowed to eat scavenger animals that ate roadkill, for example. Why? Because those animals lived on death. God had a reason for all of his prohibitions in the Old Testament. And these animals that he forbade, that he prohibited, often, often, they lived uh, on death. They survived on death, the death of other animals or other creatures. But anyway, here they're sorting uh, the good fish into containers and threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. And that and the place there will be, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, what? Let's ask this question. What is the surprise in this parable? Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like, you fill in the blank, this net catches all kinds of fish, sorting. What is surprising about the kingdom of God here? Everything's mixed together, then it gets sorted. Everything is mixed together, and then later, at the end, it gets sorted, right? Think about this. I could ask the question another way. What is Jesus like? When I ask, what is the kingdom of God like? Your answer is right. But what is Jesus like? Who did Jesus hang around with? <laughs> well, he hung around with people who were not very upstanding people. I would suggest, however, please listen carefully, because a lot of people don't say this. These were people who came to Jesus in faith and penitence. They did not come in hardness of heart. I think that's important to realize because a lot of people today say, oh, look, Jesus loved everybody. We should too. Wait, wait a minute. He called Zacchaeus. He sees Zacchaeus this defiled, dirty hands. He's dealing Roman money, tax collector in a sycamore tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, Come down. I want to go to your house today. 
and Zacchaeus comes and Zacchaeus, if you know the story, Zacchaeus is converted. He's converted and he says, okay, I'm going to pay back everything I've stolen times four. Zacchaeus is converted. See, Jesus, yes, Jesus hung out with people of all kinds, but these all kinds of people came to Jesus in faith and humility and repentance. Okay. Um, why do I say this? I want to make this point because often today people, you'll hear people say, Jesus takes us as we are. That's a half truth and half truths are no better than untruths. Why is that a half truth? Jesus takes us as we are, finish the sentence, but he doesn't leave us there. You see that? So many times I said last week, heresy begins with what is not said. So all, if all you say is Jesus takes us as we are, amen, let's go home, praise the Lord. You have not spoken the truth. Jesus takes us as we are and he cleans us up and he doesn't leave us where we are. That's the important thing that most people, not most, I don't know about that, many people forget and don't talk about. So, you know, I asked you, what is the kingdom like? You said all different kinds come in. But there's going to be a sorting, isn't there? And that sorting occurs at the end of history, at the end of history. When the angels come, he sends the angels. We talked about this in the parable of the weeds, I think last week. Hmm? Now, the question is whether we, you and I, can wait for that to happen. If we have enough confidence in the sorting process that it's going to get sorted out, the day will come when, when the Lord returns to judge the living and the dead and he casts his enemies into eternal destruction, but he takes his friends, his followers, his believers, he takes them with him. I say the question, that's how the kingdom works, by the way. Right now, I said last week, you look at the church, you look at the church, that's one of the reference of the kingdom. My heart, my personal life, the church, the world. The church is a mixed company. We, we don't know who is who. God hasn't given us that, uh, that insight, that ability. But we can be sure because the, old, the New Testament reveals this to us that, that there are among believers those who say they believe but don't walk it. They don't live it. Now, we have a job to do. We have a job to do with regard to church discipline, with regard to the protection of the flock from the wolves and all of that. But there are many, there, there may be many instances where people don't betray their unbelief. They don't demonstrate their unbelief. Only God knows. Am I making sense? Do you understand? You know, that means <clears throat> in the church, we're called to love and serve everybody. That's why one of the most wicked things that can happen in the church is group formation. Group formation. You know what I'm talking about, where we have click, clicks, clicks. And oftentimes, clicks in the church, groups occur around shared loyalties, shared likes. And we've got to be very careful about that. That's why I'm glad, I hope I'm not stepping on any too many toes here. I'm glad this congregation, this church does not have a motorcycle club. <laughs> I like motorcycles. I used to have one. But you see, what happens is you, you isolate people who don't happen to have that hobby. Now, I have other hobbies, but I would not wish to see them groupified in the church. Let's get all the chess players after Sunday morning service. I, I play chess in that corner. 
you know, or whatever. You get my point. That's why I'm, I'm glad we have intergenerational worship. That's so important. I shouldn't go on long about this. I could. How important intergenerational worship is. Where, by the way, you know where intergenerational worship began, don't you? Read your Bible in the Old Testament. We're going to come, I don't know when, <laughs> we're going to come to it in Nehemiah. I don't know when, where we're going to read, we're going to read how Israel stood around listening after, their, after they came back from the exile, they came home and they listened to the law being read publicly and the parents are standing there with their children. You say, oh, that was Old Testament. Let me give you a New Testament in Ephesians 6, a letter, an epistle that was designed to be read among the churches, to the church. So, you know, the pastor would get up and say, uh, Brother Paul sent us this letter, Ephesians 6. And in Ephesians 6, it says, parents, raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Children, obey your, did that ever strike you that they must have been in the audience? To hear that, they were. So intergenerational worship is a New Testament phenomenon too. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. This is the first commandment with promise. Paul wrote to children, boys and girls, who got to hear, oh, by the way, this is one of the benefits of this. The kids got to hear God through Paul talk to mom and dad, didn't they? <laughs> So as they're going home in the car on Sunday, imagine, Dad, remember what Paul said to us this morning in Ephesians 6, you know? And husbands and wives in that same passage, or Ephesians 5, rather. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, be in submission to your husbands. They heard it together in the presence of each other. That's why, again, I'm in favor of intergenerational and co-educational worship. So we don't send the, the ladies out to the narthex, or the men, for that matter. We are together under the preaching of the Word of God. So anyway, the point being, we've got to get back to the parable. The kingdom operates in history with this mixture. And by the way, this is why you and I, I think you're with me on this, we don't believe in what's called the pure church model. The pure church model is very rigorous in who it lets in and who it puts out. See? I don't know, and I, I don't care to know, if anybody drinks alcohol in this congregation. But you know, there are some churches which, if you drink alcohol, you are not going to be a member in this church. You know that, huh? or smoke tobacco. Well, that's a little iffier, but hey, you know, those are things we, we don't believe and practice the pure church model. Now, there are certainly areas where we can encourage, disciple, nurture, etc. Have you ever, I don't, don't, don't be, I don't mean to be personal here. I don't mean to be uh, uh, probing. But have you ever had to work with somebody who has a problem with gambling? What would happen in the church if we had such a person? Well, hopefully, given the parable, that sorting is going to work itself out later, isn't it? We have to be careful to protect the church so such a person, you know, we wouldn't make them an elder, we wouldn't make them, certainly wouldn't make them a deacon. Um, Pardon? Treasure. Treasure, yeah. <laughs> right, right. But look, I mean, I'll be very, this is a very sensitive subject, but you know that teachers here, leaders here undergo a background check by the church when they are placed into service. I think that's good. Should there be a person, and I'm not asking, I'm not imagining anything, but should there be a person who has a kind of record that prohibits, or at least should prohibit that person from working with children or young people, 
we would not per probably deny them church membership, but we would certainly restrict church leadership and church involvement. Okay, those are two different things, keep in mind. But sometimes when we go for the perfect church model, we look for the men. The only guys we let in are the guys who are potential elders. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, that's a pretty high standard according to the Bible itself, you know. And sometimes there are men who, who don't meet those criteria. They can be members of, they're, they're part of the fish, part of the fish that are caught. And the sorting is going to happen, again, according to the parable, when the angels come and separate the evil from the righteous. I tell you, therefore, it takes a lot of grace to live in the kingdom because not everybody is as good as you. Not everybody is as pure and upright as you, certainly as me. And so we have to tone it down a little bit with regard to our demands for perfection, our demands for purity, our demands for um, uh, all of these things that we tend to shy away from. The kingdom of God is a, I know, if this is fair, I think this is fair to say, the kingdom of God can be a messy business. You've got people whose lives are broken and they come into the kingdom. You've got people whose lives are broken and they come into the church, see? Not everybody comes into the church with a spotless record, you know? Some of us got some pretty lousy marks on our report card, but we're in the church and we have to learn how to, how the kingdom operates. The kingdom operates when we lock arms, even with such people as that. And we're a pilgrim tribe and we move ahead step by step in this life. Does that make sense? You get it? Any comments? We're, we're coming to the end here. Any comments about this parable or any questions? Maybe what I've said to you bothers you a little bit. Maybe, you know, there's a little pinprick of, of doubt or question that you might have. Now's the time. Kind of continuing with uh, what Patrick said earlier about uh, the government or the, uh, the kingdoms, whatever you want to call it, the states seizing the role of being the provider for the needy. They've done that with actually a lot of church um, ministries as far as the infirm, caring for the infirm. A lot of hospitals used to be ran by Christians. Yeah, yeah, your, <clears throat> your point is, is, is good, is well stated. It's, it has to do with how so many areas of the church's life have been handed over, seeded as we say, C-E-D, seeded over to the state. And if you study history, if you study history, and that's more than 20 years ago, if you go back hundreds of years, where did the schools and universities begin? <laughs> They began in and under with the monastic movement. Monks started. Where did the hospitals begin? Often with the convents, the nuns, again, the monasteries and the nuns, so health care and so forth. The monasteries in the feudal system were sources of industry, compassion and mercy, education, and so on. Now, I understand we live today. We don't live hundreds of years ago. But isn't it interesting? I, you know, uh, let, me, let, let me do this little sermon here a minute. A lot of us are disgusted, and rightly so, with the mess that was made with COVID, right? And I could go on and on and on, and you don't want to hear it. But I give thanks to God for COVID for a couple of reasons, one of which is finally parents began to see what their kids were being taught in the schools. 
And what we're seeing around the country is parents, unfortunately, not knowing self-control and all those kinds of virtues often, but parents storming school board meetings, demanding that things be changed with regard to what their children are being taught. And it's good. By the way, you know, don't you, that the education of children, according to God's design, belongs first of all to parents. Now, you didn't hear me say parents have to be the teachers, but they have to supervise and superintend the teaching of their children. We have, in our country, we have long ago lost that and seeded, seeded, handed it over. See? And by the way, um, this little test run we had over the past three years with regard to how far the state could push the church was not benign. It was not benign. Meaning, some lessons were learned, I think, on both sides. Churches realized, whoo, whoo, this could happen like that. That's all it takes. Somebody has to say the word emergency. And things lock up and tighten up very quickly. The state learned Oh, well, you know, there are some kinds of churches out there we can't push around. We better identify them. Can you spell FBI? <laughs> you know. Pardon me? NSA, in God we trust, all others we Yeah, right, right. Well, you see, I, I don't mean to make a scare thing out of this. I just mean to open our eyes to the fact that what the church used to do, what the church used to be committed to doing, the state readily, eagerly takes over. Education, we'll do that. You just, you, you know, you play your games, you go to the football games, you go to the basketball games, you take care of whatever, you, we'll take care of your kids. They belong to us, don't they? Do you think it's uh, the domino effect of the faithlessness of the church though? Yeah. Well, yes. Yes, I think that to the extent that, the, and by the way, this is centuries in the making. I mean, if you, study, if you study American church history, you see how these things evolved and emerged. Uh, education, all you gotta, all you gotta do is study, do a study of the life and writings of John Dewey. And you'll figure out very quickly how this all came about, how this all came about. You know, we, uh, I, I can't go on, I mean, but, but, um, yeah, the church, that's why the church is called to be a community, a new humanity. The church ought to have within itself everything that makes humanity humanity. And, and that whole idea of monasteries wasn't necessarily bad because they had, they had industry, they had farming, they had crafts, they had, and so forth and so on. Um, unfortunately, you know, we have lost a lot as we live in this world. Take, for example, the Industrial Revolution, how that affected life. It broke apart families. The automobile, you think the car's great. You got here tonight. Do you know what the car did to the family? Because now, te now the teenagers can go out on their own. Before, they couldn't. Well, that doesn't make the car bad. It just means we gotta, we gotta think about these things. Yes, in, almost. Let me, let me tweak that a little bit. I mean, rather than fight evil, I think we need to generate good. We need to generate our own culture, generate our own, our own solutions, generate our own uh, answers to these problems. See? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, like I said, with the kingdom, those, those three reference, per, God rules in my heart, that's where it's got to start. He's got to rule in all of our hearts. And then we, together as a church, we're able to stand in the world and be under the rule of God in all of our activities. Yeah. All right. We better, we better call it here. Yeah. Did you, did you say? Okay. All right. Let's close with prayer, shall we? 
Thank you, Father, for this time together. We thank you for this time of year because we recognize your handiwork in creation. But as we study about the kingdom, we learn about its mysteries, we learn about its power, its hiddenness, its smallness, and yet its greatness, as great as the world itself. We have a savior, a king, who became weak, who emptied himself, who emptied himself and became nothing for us. And he rose again from the dead and has ascended and sits at your right hand, king of the universe. And he is pre preparing for himself a worldwide kingdom. Thank you that we know him, that we may know his kingdom, belong to it, and that we may gladly submit to his rule in all of our lives and in all of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.